This evening's scripture is found in Mark chapter 10, verses 1 through 12, on page numbers 845 and 846 in the Bibles on your chairs. And he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and the crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up and in order to test him asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. This is the word of the Lord. Can you hear everybody? Am I on, guys? There I am. Hello. Nice to see you all here today, uh, tonight. Uh, and by the way, thank you to all of you that uh, are trying this out and seeing if this will work for you on Saturday nights. Uh, we need to free up the space at 1045, especially on Sundays. And so those of you that are here, because I asked... Uh, bless you. Bless you greatly for that. I appreciate that. Hey, quickly, there is going to be a meeting right after this service upstairs in the youth room. If you're interested in going to Thailand, we did this trip at the beginning of this year. We're going to do it kind of right on the tail end of this year and the beginning of next year. It's about a 10-day trip. Great trip, ministering and working over there. But if that's something you want to know more about it, then make sure you run upstairs and, uh, and, and just sit in on that meeting quickly to hear, hear what's going on, Okay. All right, well, uh, we've got a lot to do tonight, and so I'm just going to dive right in. Research tells us that 9 out of 10 Americans will marry, okay? In fact, um, the number of women who remain single uh, all their lives is lower today than it was at the start of the 20th century, and yet nearly 40% of first marriages will end in divorce. 60% of those involve children. Um, and those children who come out of divorced homes are statistically, now of course we know there's exceptions, but statistically are more likely to be poor, to commit crime, to drop out of school, to have lower grades, to have emotional uh, problems. There's probably not one person in this room that has not in some way been touched by divorce whether you've been divorced personally or mom and dad have been divorced or somebody close to your family, all of us, one way or another, have been touched by divorce. So today, I want to talk about, and again, I didn't pick this out of a hat. Hey, let's talk about divorce. Like last week, I didn't just decide, let's talk about hell. Um, I said, we need to talk about it because Jesus talks about it. Now, here's what's interesting. Why does Jesus talk about it? I mean, why, why in the middle of this book, Mark had all kinds of material. We know that in the Gospels, there's all kinds of things we don't know about Jesus. We just know what they wrote. So why divorce? Why did Mark and others decide, oh yeah, let's, let's add a lesson on divorce here? That's an interesting question. Because ultimately, this is a book about knowing Jesus, and why do we want to know Jesus? This isn't just to satisfy our intellectual curiosity. It's so that we can become followers of him. You can't follow who you don't know. And so it's a book ultimately about discipleship, about apprenticeship, about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And one of the things that should be abundantly clear as we go through this book is that discipleship isn't just intellectual. It's not theoretical. It's not just saying spiritual things. It's not going through spiritual motion. It is intensely practical. It is even, I mean this in the best possible way, mundane. Um, because discipleship, if you read the word of God, lays claim to every second of your life. It's not just about private prayers and religious feelings. 
following Jesus impacts what you say, where you work, the friends you have, how you raise your kids. It pushes against you when you sin. It lays claim and says your money is not your own. Your time is not your own. It walks into your bedroom. It talks to you about your sex life. It wakes up with you on Monday morning. It influences every day of every moment all the time. It is intensely, intensely practical. So is it any wonder that Jesus would deal with a very hot issue in his day, by the way, um, this issue of divorce. When we look at our lives and go, there's not one of us that hasn't been touched by this. Now, I want to tell you up front, I know that in this room, we have a lot of people that have been divorced. We have a lot of children of divorced homes. My goal, please hear me, is not to stir up hurt feelings. My, my goal is not to heap guilt on people. I simply want you to understand what the Word of God says. And I, frankly, I want to serve you. I want some of you to be out un, from under bondage. I want some of you to have a fresh understanding. I hope, by the grace of God, some marriages are saved. Um, so, so I really want to, if, I, if you will, develop a theology of divorce and remarriage for you that comes out of Scripture. Now, what that means is, you know, ordinarily, if you're new tonight, ordinarily we'll take a passage like this and I'll just kind of go, okay, let's read verse, you know, one and then tell you about it, verse two and tell you about it kind of thing. We're going to do a little differently tonight. I want to try to be intensely, intensely practical with you. Because I want you to be able to serve people that you know. I want you to be able to serve your spouse. If you're married, I want this to be something that, that, that you can look at and go, man, I want our marriage to stay together. I want, I want husbands to love their wives and wives to love their husbands. Okay, so, so we're going to get real practical. We've got a lot of material to cover, okay? So buckle up and, and let's do this. Um, I, I want to talk about marriage, the myths, the facts, what Scripture says, and I want to talk about, about, about divorce, what it says, talk about remarriage, answer maybe some questions you have about that. And, and of course, I'm not going to be able to answer all your questions, but I'm going I'm to try and, and answer what I feel like are some of the most frequently asked questions. Okay, so let's talk about marriage, and I'm gonna, I want to talk about some, some myths and some facts, okay? Now, here's what I'm going to do. When we talk about myths and facts, I'm just going to talk to you about what the culture says, about marriage, and maybe you've heard this, and maybe you've even said some of these things, and I'm not even going to go to the Bible on this part. We're going to get to the Bible in a second, but I'm going to let research talk for us, and I want you to hear what some of the research, so if you're not a believer here tonight, or you're not sure, all oh, that Bible thing, whatever, well, here, I want to tell you what people who aren't even Christians are saying about this stuff, okay? All right, so, so let's just do this. Number one, the first myth that maybe you've heard is, I think it's a good idea for me to live with my boyfriend, my girlfriend, before we get married. Okay, that's very, very common out there, right? So, in fact, 60% of high school senior boys, 50% of high school senior girls would agree with that statement right there. They've been told why. I mean, they, they're, they're being raised in this environment that says, look, it's a good thing to test drive a relationship, right? To try on the shoe, make sure it fits. People want to make sure that this thing's going to work out. And they live in a culture where divorce is so prevalent that they're scared to death. And they want to make sure they test it out before so they know it's going to work. Now, that sounds incredibly reasonable, right? But there are literally reams of research. I mean, I was buried in research this week that says cohabit, this is not Christian research. Cohabitation is a terrible idea. I mean, you, you just got to turn on the TV. Dr. Phil says this. Okay, like, like, listen, he says this. People, quote, People who live together are more likely to have marriages that end in divorce, end quote. He says in another place, after five to seven years, only 21% of unmarried couples were still living together. Okay, that, that's him. <laughs> and, I, and I actually found the research that he was talking about. In fact, the research suggests that couples who live together and get married divorce at a rate 46% higher than non-cohabiting couples. And cohabitation, ladies, is especially bad for you. Statistically, a woman in a cohabiting relationship is two times more likely to suffer physical and sexual abuse. 
Two studies found, two independent studies found that women in cohabiting relationships are nine times more likely to be killed by their partner than women in marriages. Listen, this is not a good idea. It's a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea. If you're living together, listen, again, we're not even going to go to the Bible yet. We'll get there. You shouldn't be. You put yourself in a very bad position. Okay, how about this? Myth number two. People, okay, people would say this. People live longer and they can't be expected now to, to stay together for a lifetime. Right? I mean, come on. Yeah, people live until they're 90. You can't expect somebody to go, uh, get married on 20, I'm going to be married 70 years. That's crazy. Okay, now here, you know, first of all, this has absolutely no basis in fact. The living longer... Do you know why statistically we're living longer than we used to? Because we've done something about the infant mortality rate. So our averages have now swung in the opposite direction. So, so look at it. The, the, the reason lifetime expectancies were so, so low is because we had this mortality rate. But look, so take that out. We're not living longer, but add to that the fact that most divorces happen in the first seven years. And this is stupid. That's a cop out. You can't expect to be married, you know, 90 years. Well, how about eight? <laughs> Ten. Right? I mean, this, again. How about this one? Number three, don't get married. It'll ruin your sex life. Right? Some guys think, oh, yeah, I got to stay free. You know what? It's ridiculous. And again, I'm not, I'm not going to take your scripture yet. There, 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 there is one large-scale national study that was done. It says not only do, couple, do married couples have sex more often, they enjoy it more both physically and emotionally. The most satisfied intimate relationships are within the context of marriage. I mean, now look, that is, that, that, that's almost common knowledge among researchers. It's that prevalent. Number four, how about this? We don't need a piece of paper to prove our love. This is the Brangelina exception, right? <laughs> right? I'm not getting married. It's just a piece of paper, you know, not until everybody can be married or whatever. Well, look, okay. The research paints a different picture. Living together, the research tells us, does not bring the same benefits physically, financially, emotionally. And you know one of the reasons they say, and this is kind of off to the side here, one of the reasons they say is that, is that couples that live together have less um, impetus to engage intensely in conflict resolution. What makes a marriage a wonderful thing is that you go, we're going to work this out. When you can just go, eject, done. See, the research says that cohabiting couples tend not to be as committed as married couples. They're more oriented toward their own personal autonomy and less to the well-being of their partner. Okay? Okay, so that, that, now we could have gone on and on. There's other myths out there I could deal with, but let me, let me, let me talk about the Bible. Like I said, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Okay, so what does the Bible say? What does Jesus say? Here we are in Mark 10. And the first thing we know from the Bible is that God designed marriage for one man and one woman. If you want to look at Mark uh, 10, chapter 6, it says, they shall become one flesh. Um, he, I'm sorry, ver verse 7, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and, and hold fast to his wife. Verse 6 says that God created them male and female. You go back to Genesis chapter, 20, ch chapter 2, verses 22 to 25. This is, where, this is where Jesus is taking that. It says God created male and female and then joins them together. So now I don't have time to fully unpack and enter into this cultural discussion everybody's having right now of, you know, can homosexuals marry? But listen, let me just say this. It makes no difference what the state of California or any other state or what the president of the United States or anybody says uh, about marriage and what they want to define it as. The, 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 we're, we're not, I'm not holding up Christian morals. These are God's standards, male and Female is what makes a marriage, God says. And if you want to know where I stand, okay, because I, I don't want to be shy about that. I think you should know. Then, then here you go. And again, I don't have time to unpack it all. I believe it is right and fitting for a government to define marriage as between one man and one woman. I, I don't agree that, that with, that, 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 um, with same-sex marriage because that's not how the Bible defines it. And I don't believe this violates anyone's fundamental rights. 
And here's why. I mean, look at a definition to define marriage doesn't prohibit anyone from getting marriage married. It simply says that to be called a marriage, it requires, you know, marrying somebody of the opposite sex. And that is equally available to anybody. Okay? All right, some of you are like, now I'm mad. Okay, well, let's, let's keep going. <laughs> okay, number two, ma- marriage is a work of God, and it gets its meaning from God. Okay, okay look, at, look, at, look at verse 7. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast, and they shall become one flesh. Look at verse 9. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. This is God's doing. This is God's deal, right? So so marriage isn't just human institution. So why do we get to define it that way or whatever? It's not just a human decision. It's not just a tradition. Marriage is something that God does, even, by the way, if you're not a Christian. It's not just a piece of paper that legitimizes a relationship. It is a God-ordained institution. And if God made it, then only God can undo it. Okay, number three. God designed marriage to be a permanent union of oneness. Again, this is what he just said, that that a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast, so they are no longer, verse 8, they are no longer two, but one Flesh. Now, what is this oneness that we're talking about? Well, look, is it sexual union? Yes, it is, but it's so much more than that. Jesus says the reason divorce shouldn't happen is because it's rooted in creation, not Moses. See, one of his problems, by the way, with the Pharisees is they're going to do what a lot of people do today. They'll go back and they'll pluck one verse and go, aha, I've now got the Bible to support me. And Jesus goes, wait. Guys, you're calling this a command. You're saying Moses commanded you to get divorced. No, no, no. He allowed it because you're hardness of heart. And let me give you the broader picture. One of the, one of the uh, initial principles of interpreting Scripture is that we let Scripture interpret Scripture. We don't just pull something out of context and go, boom, I can support my point. So what does Jesus do? I'm going to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Guys, let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back before Moses ever got on the scene. God creates one man, they become one flesh. Oneness. See, look, this is why, this this is where the tradition of a woman taking her husband's last name, that's why you share a bank account, that's why you sleep in one bed, that's why you have one house. The husband and the wife are meant to become one as God, the Trinity, is one. Okay, number four, marriage is a covenant not a contract. Now, you've got all kinds of verses that we've, we've put with that, and I'm going to let you look those up. But look, um, the culture sees marriage as a contract. And what's a contract? A, a contract is simply an agreement where two or more parties promise to do something in exchange for a valuable benefit. Okay, I went to law school, and remember this, like one of the first things you study is contracts, okay? And how do you make a contract? What breaks? And if one party doesn't perform his or her side, the contract is breached and can be nullified. So you promise to be this way, to do this thing, and you didn't perform, so in a marriage, the contract can be nullified. Or worse yet, thanks to California, on January 1, 1970, we were the first people to have no fault divorce. You don't have to have any reason at all to break the contract. You can say, I want out. So now every state in the union, you can divorce for any reason or no reason at all. But the Bible says that marriage is a spiritual, it's a covenant between two people. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you no matter what you do I will always be faithful to you. That's covenant love. That's what God says. This was intended to last forever. Okay, number five, marriage is a partnership. 
Okay, I mean, this is Ephesians 5 where, you know, first he starts off in verse 21 and says, you know, submit to one another. And then he starts talking to wives and he talks to, to husbands. He says, here's the part you play, here's the part you play. And the partner, in a partnership, each partner plays a unique role. For men, your role is leadership. It is to ensure the well-being of your wife and your children, even at great personal sacrifice. I've told you before, guys, it's real easy. You just be Jesus in the relationship. That's, that's all you got to do. Just be like Jesus. No problem, right? So that means you're not single anymore, guys. If you're married, right, you're not single. And if you want to be single, don't get married. Because 1 Timothy 5.8, Paul says to Timothy, look, if a man man needs to provide for his family, because if he doesn't, he's worse than an unbeliever. So that providing and leading, it's your job, and you'll be held accountable for it, not her. Wives, your responsibility is to submit to your husband's loving leadership. And I know you hate that word. I didn't make it up. That's in the Bible. Every time, every time in the New Testament, God talks about a wife, not women, a wife. He says submit. That's not, that's not look at, you say, well, I don't want to do that. Wait, wait. Uh, you know, I think the culture's got a better way. Really? Really? We do? You, you, you think things are going well out there? See, in fact, I would say it this way. You are most like Jesus when you submit to your husband because he's in submission to the Father. Okay, so what does all this mean? I mean, again, we go on and on. You put all this picture together and you discover that marriage isn't just a piece of paper. It has much bigger meaning scripturally. And it means that another, another fallout of that is that Living together isn't acceptable, okay? Because it's not marriage. There is no covenant. A marriage is both spiritual and legal. Romans 13, one to three, you go look at it, says that we are supposed to submit to the authorities. And one of the things that the people, the authorities of our land, at least right now, have said is that if we're gonna call you a marriage, there has to be, it has to be this legal thing that happens just the peace. Pastor, somewhere, somebody's gotta say this thing's legal. And if you're just living together, then it's not legal. It's not, it's not, the, the state doesn't even recognize it. Well, can't you just treat us like we're married? Because no, you're not like married. And if you're living together and sleeping together, then look, you're sinning. And and if you need help, right? Look, I I get that. Some Some of you believe that there's no other way. We have to live together. We couldn't afford to do it. Listen, That's what we're here for. And I I mean this with all sincerity. You come talk to me. You come talk to one of our pastors. I'll tell you right now, we'll do everything we can to help you get the counseling you need, to separate until you can get married, and you can get married in a God-honoring way. We, We don't want you feeling like, man, we can't afford, we can't do this. We want to help you if you want to be helped. But if you're saying, no. I just want to live together and sleep together, and I think you ought to prove that. Well, we're not going to. Don't ask a Foothill Church pastor to marry you. Okay, number six, marriage is a mysterious reflection of the gospel. Again, this is, I'm not, I don't have time to read you all these verses. I'm giving them to you, and I want you to look at them. You see, here's what God does. God creates this one flesh, and Paul says this is a deep mystery in Ephesians 5. He says, I'm talking about this mystery, and this mystery is Christ and his church. So when God joins a man and a woman together, he does it at deeper levels than any of us could possibly realize. So deep, he says it's mysterious. And this is why, by the way, that divorce is so painful. Because look, we got this oneness happening. The union of a man and a wife is a reflection, Paul says, of the union between Christ and his church. And that union is an ocean of deep, unseen, mysterious wonders, not a backyard swimming pool for you to lounge around and put your feet in when you feel like it. It's a mystery. And so when men like Pat Robertson last year go on air and say something like, uh, you know, if a, if, a, if a wife has Alzheimer's, you know, that's basically a death and a husband ought to be able to divorce his wife and that's not against scripture or whatever. Listen, 
This is what I'm talking about. If our marriage is a reflection of Christ in the church, what do we know about Christ in his church? Christ never leaves us. And so Dr. Russell Moore says this. He says, look, when Pat Robertson talks like this, it's more than an embarrassment. It's more than cruelty. It is a repudiation of the gospel, which your marriage was intended to reflect. So you're free to abandon your spouse when Christ abandons his. All right, so that's marriage. Now let's talk about divorce. Let's talk about the myths and let's talk about the facts, okay? Again, we're going to talk about just kind of cultural stuff and then we'll get to the Bible in a second. Okay, what are the myths? Well, probably the biggest myth that any of us have heard is this. Christians divorce at the same rate as the culture. Heard this one? Anybody? Right? Somebody said, you know, it's a 50% divorce rate outside the church, 50% in the church. The church is no different. This one is so popular <laughs> um, and so inaccurate. Uh, and, and here's why. Because if all you do to decide if it's the same inside as outside is ask somebody, are you a Christian? Yes. Did you get divorced? Yes. Well, then we take it at face value and go, oh, they're a Christian. Okay. Professor Bradley Wilcox, he's a sociologist at the University of Connecticut, did this study, and he says, this is not true at all. He says that people who identify themselves, just say, I'm a Christian, because you know what? I'm American, right? Isn't that the same? Um, I'm a Christian, they identify themselves as Christian, but rarely attend church, have a 60% divorce rate. Of those who attend church regularly, the number drops to 38%. That is statistically a massive difference. Another Professor Bradley Wilcox from the University of Virginia agrees, and he says that active conservative Protestants who regularly attend church are 35% less likely to divorce than the general population. But now listen to this one. <laughs> the most disturbing statistic of all is that if you're a Christian in name only, I don't just call myself a Christian. You ask me I'm a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm American, I'm whatever. You're a Christian in name only? You're what somebody would call a nominal Christian? You are 20% more likely to divorce than the rest of secular America. Not, not, not more than church-going, you know, Bible-believing, faithful Christians. So the divorce rates of committed Christians are not identical to the general population. They're not even close. Now that ought to be, in some ways, a great encouragement, and in other ways, kind of a kick in the pants. How serious are you about your faith? Because if you're just dancing around it, you're in that category of 20% higher than secular America. If you're like, man, I'm serious about this then you are statistically much, much lower chance. Okay, here's another myth. So I learned from my first marriage and expect my second marriage to be better. Okay, now look, this isn't to, some of you are in second marriages and some of you are in very happy second marriages, praise God. What I'm trying to talk to here are those that just sort of think, you know, that was sort of my tryout session and I'm moving on to another one. Well, look, the Bible, the, the, Bible, the, the research says that the divorce rate goes up for every marriage you've had, 67% of marriage, second marriages then in divorce. 74% of third marriages then in divorce. How about this? Number three, divorce is better for our children. Right? How many have used that excuse? Right? This is a home of strife and we don't get along and we're not compatible or whatever. Well, you know what the research says? That unless those kids are living in this horrific environment, 
You know, dad's beaten mom. Something, I mean, something where it is so horrible. Not like, man, we don't get, this is just not good. And this isn't, you know, it says that, that there have been large studies that have found that children are much worse, much worse off following a divorce than if a couple who even had problems hung on for the sake of the children. And in fact, those children that come out of those homes, and many of you will know this, they have a much higher divorce rate. Why? I mean, the research says. It's because they look at it and say, we, we don't have the example of, of a couple that went through hard times and worked it out, figured it out. Okay, so what does Scripture say about divorce? Well, first of all, it says God hates divorce. Now hear me. Hear what I didn't say and what God doesn't say. God doesn't say God, the Bible doesn't say God hates divorced people. He hates divorce, but why would he use, he uses that strong of a language. He despises divorce. Why? Because it devastates people. I've never met a person who's like, man, that, that was a great experience. <laughs> I've, I've loved my divorce. Had a great time. Judge was a great guy. The attorney on the other side, oh man, we're like best friends. We're Facebook, right? <laughs> it devastates people, and God loves people. He loves people. Divorce hurts husbands, it hurts wives, it hurts children, it, it hurts extended, it tears people apart. If marriage is oneness, then divorce is dismemberment. And some of you would say that's exactly how it felt. It's like I was being ripped apart. But God hates divorce because it tarnishes the gospel. Remember what we just said? If marriage is meant to be this reflection of the gospel, then divorce shatters that reflection. That reflection. If, 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 if the echo of the gospel that's supposed to be seen in my marriage to Michelle is suddenly drowned out, the picture of what Christ's love is like gets broken. Gospel love... Gospel love is not putting the spark back into our marriage, you know, and finding the 50 techniques of a great sex life in Cosmo. It's not putting the sizzle back in my life. Gospel love, Pat Robertson, is being faithful with a cross on your back. Gospel love is drowning in your own blood. And divorce snuffs out the message of the gospel. That's why God hates it. What else does it say? It says that an illegitimate, number two, an illegitimate divorce can cause a little one who believes to something. Remember what we talked about last week? Remember what Jesus said? Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me, who's he talking about? Not just children. And certainly it applies to children. It's any, any disciple. And he says, be worse for you to have a horrific death by drowning than what awaits you if you cause one of my little ones who believe to stumble. And do you know what the Bible says? Matthew 5.32 says that if you divorce your spouse for unbiblical reasons, just because you feel like it, no fault, divorce, whatever, you don't have a biblical reason, and it says that you make them commit adultery. Now, do we all know adultery is a sin, is stumbling. And when you do that to your spouse, you cause them to sin. And Jesus says, woe to you. Better a horrific death than what awaits you if that's what you do. I think it's no big deal at all. It's a huge deal. Okay, but Scripture tells us there are times when divorce is legitimate. So when is that? When is divorce legitimate? Legitimate. So again, I got to do this quickly. Well, first of all, when sexual sins break the marriage covenant. Now, I want to be careful here. Okay, obviously, adultery is one of those. Okay, now I can say that, and some of you think, eject button, I'm out. Okay, but, but listen, is it a sin? Yes. If a husband goes and cheats on his wife, it's a sin. And I'm not saying this always happens, but what if we could peel back the layers and find out that there was a wife who utterly refused to be intimate with her husband 
for a year or two, and he kind of, you know, felt under so much pressure or whatever. He went, he did some one-night stand with a girl. Is that a sin? Did the husband sin? Absolutely. Did you sin by tempting him like that? Absolutely. Could you get a divorce? You could. But I think you've got some blame to bear. See, see, look at, I know marriages that have survived adultery. Right? I think many of you, I, I hope you do. I mean, look at, but, but there's a difference between a one-time affair, and again, you, you, you can do it, and serial adultery. See, I think God ultimately doesn't want divorce ever. He wants there to be reconciliation. He wants there to be repentance. He wants people to turn from sin. He wants there to be forgiveness. He wants there to be mercy. He wants that thing to survive. That's what God wants. But sometimes it gets so broken from that that it can't survive. So adultery is one. Another one's sexual immorality. I mean, this would include, I mean, this is all kinds of sexual sin. It could be homosexuality. It could be lesbianism. It's incest, porno, porno, you know, addiction, pornography. It could be sexual deviancy. There are, there are ways that sexual immorality so breaks the marriage covenant that, that God says, you're justified. I mean, I, I, I know women who have said, I, the pornography was out of control. I mean, it was just, I, I couldn't stop him. And they got a divorce. And I think the Bible says that's legitimate in instances like that. So there are times when sexual sin reaches a point in the marriage that, that divorce is legitimate. I'm just pleading with you, don't hear that as an automatic eject button, okay? See if God won't fix it. Okay, second of all, when one spouse abandons the other. This is the Pauline exception in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul's talking about instances. Now, here's what he's saying. I'll be, I want to be, be real honest with Scripture. He talks about an instant when a non-Christian spouse doesn't want to be married to a believing spouse anymore. Okay, so you got married. Both of you were non-Christians or something like that. One of you becomes a Christian. The non-Christian spouse says, I want out. Paul says, look, if that happens... Divorce is permissible. You didn't instigate it. He, do, he doesn't say, by the way, the Christian should go, hey, you're not a Christian, I am, I want out. No, no, no. He says if the non-Christian instigates it, then, then, then he says that, that's permissible. Now, now he's, again, he's not saying you must. He's saying that would be permissible. Now, listen, this is not a license for any person who calls themselves a Christian to marry a non-Christian. If you are not married already, you must not, cannot, will not marry a non-Christian and be obedient to God. The Bible's very clear about this. A Christian does not marry a non-Christian. You marry someone who loves Jesus. They come, ladies, and ask you out for a date. Your first question is, do you love Jesus? And if they say yes, fine, then you say, do you have a job? <laughs> okay? And if you get two yeses, go, right? Have fun. Any of those are a no, say, talk to me later. My little, my girls, I'm like, guys, what do we say? What's the, what's the deal? You know, some guy, you, if you're going to send a guy to talk to me, what better we know? He's a Christian. Yes, good girl, right? A plus, star. Okay? Okay, well, Chris, what about an abusive relationship? Now, we might talk about this under a different category, but I, I, I would be one that would say, I think there are times when abuse is abandonment. And I would, I would not be willing to look at this man, and it could be a woman, but let's just say most often it's a man. I would not be willing to look at this man who abuses his wife and his children over and over and over again and say, you're genuinely a believer in Jesus. So, so look, you, ladies, because I know this most often applies to you, you are not, the Bible does not require you to stay with a man who abuses you. You get out, you get help, you come to us, you call the police. That's what we would do. 
And I think it's possible for one spouse to desert a marriage, to abandon a marriage without physically leaving the home. I remember an example several years ago. There was a family and, and, and the, the wife and her children, I mean, their husband lived there and the husband to talk to him, nicest guy in the world. You know, kind of milk toasty, but nice. And, and utterly abandoned them. Absolutely did nothing to help them. I can think of another example. A husband literally moved out of the home and his kids, as far as I know, to this day, have still not heard from their dad. Can a woman get divorced then? Yes. See, if a man refuses to support his wife and children, now ladies, this isn't like, you know, I don't think he's doing it right. Okay, like, get some objective third party. Get a pastor involved in that. Let's talk about that. But you do that and you continue to do that unrepentantly, you've deserted them. Okay, how about this? Treachery or treasonous betrayal. This is, this is Malachi chapter 2 where it talks about, you know, uh, uh, betraying the covenant. There's a breach of a covenant that destroys oneness. There's a safety that, and loyalty that's intended in a marriage. And again, I think this could be abuse. I, could this be, I think this would be utter neglect. Um, you know, somebody, cut, they're, they're being cruel in the marriage. They completely cut off uh, intimacy. They completely cut off finances. They completely shut themselves out from love. Then look at, I think you're acting treasonously towards your spouse, and that could be grounds for a divorce. Jesus seems to say the fourth one would be hardness of heart. Moses wrote this commandment because you have hard hearts. That there are times when divorce is, and listen, it's not a command, it's a concession. That there are times when, when hardness of heart violates both the relationship with the spouse and the relationship with God. And what is hardness of heart? It is a stubborn, ongoing, willful, unrepentant sin that breaks the covenant. Now, there you go. There are no other legitimate reasons that the Bible gives. None. Okay, so, so, so then let's talk about remarriage real quick, okay? Okay, what are the guidelines for remarriage? Okay, well, number one, easy one, when a spouse dies, remarriage is allowed, okay? This is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. You know, the, the, the death of a spouse, it, it severs it forever, and you're free to remarry, okay? That not, that's not really debated. Nobody's really arguing about that one. Okay, but this one's a little harder. When your spouse has committed adultery and you get a divorce as a result of that, is remarriage permitted? Well, some people are going to say no. Others are going to say yes. It's kind of a difficult issue because the truth of the matter is Jesus and Paul don't seem to make specific allowance for remarriage when this happens. But I think it's reasonable that if the innocent spouse that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter slave is not enslaved anymore to, to this uh, marriage, then that would entail the right to remarry. However, I wouldn't rush into that. Hear me, if, you, if, if your spouse has committed adultery and you got, you know, you're, you're out of that marriage now, don't rush into getting remarried. Um, you should give time for repentance and forgiveness and reconciliation. You never know that God might bring you back together. There might be genuine, heartfelt, heartbroken repentance that they would bring back. What a testimony of the grace of God. What if God would do that? How about this? You're a Christian, you commit adultery, you leave your spouse. Remarriage is not allowed. I'm talking about you're the offending party. Okay? Now, that innocent spouse, I would say, can get remarried, but you can't. Well, I heard about some pastor, I read some book that disagrees with you, Chris. Well, fine. You can always find somebody who will support what you want the Bible to say to support your lifestyle. Our position is that if you're a Christian and you destroy your marriage, you don't get another one. You had your shot. Don't ask a pastor at Foothill Church. Do not come and say, I'd like to be part of your prep for marriage class because that ain't happening. 
And if you're a member and this happens, you're subject to church discipline. Okay, you cannot do that. I just want it done with it. Okay, how about this one? You're a Christian and your non-Christian spouse divorces you. We just talked about that. Remarriage allowed. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But here again, gosh, give your ex... I mean, what, what if they'd come to faith? What if God would radically transform their heart? Again, I don't want you to think of any of these things like, boop, done. I'm going to get married now, right? How about this? You were divorced before you became a Christian. Well, I think remarriage is allowed because here again, look... Um, You were outside of Christ, now you're inside of Christ. Maybe your previous spouse has already gotten remarried, but if they haven't, you know, let, again, let God do his work. Pray for them. Ask God to save them. Give them a chance. But you can remarry as long as you marry a Christian. Okay, I hope this is clear. You know, the Christian, marrying another, a Christian should should be part of what's just uh, assumed. Okay, how about this? Your ex-spouse gets married. Okay, could have been an unbiblical divorce, whatever. The ex-spouse gets married. What do you do? I think remarriage is allowed. I think this is part of what Jesus is trying to solve here because what he's referring back to is Deuteronomy chapter 24 where they, they, you know, he, God gives and says, look, what he's trying to make sure in that culture is that women are taken care of. How easy it would have been to just dump your wife. And by the way, there was two schools of thought. One was a very liberal school that said you can divorce her for any reason. Another, liberal, uh, another conservative Jewish school back in Jesus' day that said, no, there's got to be treachery, there's got to be treason, there's got to be indecency, something like that, that that's why you can divorce your wife. What, G- what God was after was saying, no, I'm not commanding you to get a divorce. I want to protect the people that are part of this. Okay, but, but your ex-spouse goes off and gets married. Well, then I think the marriage is over. There, there's no chance. There's no possibility of reuniting with your former spouse. You're free to get married again. Okay, how about this? You divorced because you weren't compatible. What do you think I'm going to say? <laughs> The Bible is going to say. Remarriage isn't allowed. Okay, look, I'm not compatible with Michelle. You know why? Because we're both sinners, right? We both have wicked hearts. No one's compatible. That's a myth. And, and there's no ejection clause within the Scripture that says, oh, you know, we got married, bummer, we're not compatible. No, it says you better work. It's going to take a lot of work. How about this? You divorce because of abuse or child abuse or abandonment. Again, I, I think marriage is, remarriage is allowed, but, but again, let's see if God might bring your former spouse to real repentance. I'm not talking about, you know, ladies, he kind of comes around and he seems like he's doing well, jump back with him. Don't, don't be stupid. I mean, you know, an abusive man, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's something they carry with them for a long time. Don't, don't do something stupid like that. But on the other hand, what if God really did transform? And there's people like that. Okay, so let's deal kind of with some frequently asked questions, okay? Um, And these are just sort of all over the place, and I want to try to tackle these quickly. Should I be dating somebody whose divorce is still in process? No. I know somebody like this. Um, And here's what I'd say. God says, Jesus says, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. You know what you're doing? You're stepping in the middle, and you're separating potentially something that God might want to keep together. You're getting in God's ways. Don't do that. You, you, you don't want to be on God's bad side, right? Okay, if, if I was part of an unbiblical divorce and I'm now remarried, should I divorce my current spouse? Because you know what we'd say? You committed adultery. The Bible would say you've committed adultery. So what should you do? The, I, I don't think you should get divorced again. Right? Two, two wrongs don't make a right kind of thing. But, but look, should you have gotten married? No. But now that it's done, it should not be undone. It is a real marriage. There has been real vows given. There has been intimacy that has happened within that marriage. And Jesus can purify that covenant through confession, through repentance, and through forgiveness. And you don't have to go through life feeling like you are in this ongoing adulterous affair. I don't want anybody feeling like that. I want you to know you can go and, and Christ can cleanse it. That's the good news. 
Okay, about this. What can I do to safeguard my present or future marriage from divorce? Let me just talk to unmarried people here. You're not married. You want to be married. Okay? Well, let me just give you a few principles to think about. Number one, don't ever date or marry a non-Christian. Now, let me me tell you. You may may think that's ridiculous, but I can guarantee you, if you don't follow Scripture on that point, you're going to think back. I remember that crazy pastor that one Saturday night when he said that to me. Now, listen, I don't say that to say, I'm so smart. You know why I say that? I can't tell you how sick and tired I am of having women come up to me, and women, this isn't against you, come up to me and say, please pray for my husband. He doesn't follow Christ. He doesn't love Jesus, and I want him so bad to be a spiritual leader in my home. Don't do it. You will regret it a thousand times. Okay, about this, just be the person you want to attract. Right? You want a really strong believer? I've told you before, guys, it's like running around the track. I mean, you just run, right? You're running around the track, and, 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 and you're getting fit, and you're getting in shape, and pretty soon you look to your side, you look to your right, your left, and there's somebody of the opposite sex running with you, and you go, oh, all right, well, let's run around the track a few times together. It's called dating. Okay, you do that for a little while. And look, and, and you're being the person you, you want them to be. They run as fast as you do. Because here's the thing, you, you'll attract the person you are. Um, don't cohabitate before marriage. Okay, I, ho- I hope that's been clear now. Don't, 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 number four, don't think that you'll change the other person after marriage. Right? The sort of missionary marriages, I'll, they'll get saved later. No, no, statistically they will not. In fact, don't go in it for any reason to change them. I think they may be a Christian, I'm a Christian, but I'm going to change this. Marriage will change. No, it won't. In fact, sometimes marriage just makes it worse. Like, you know, you're like, wow, I thought this was small. Now it's like this evil monster is coming. I mean, it's just, it's, it, it, it exacerbates problems many times. Okay, number five, listen to your mom and dad. Now Listen. I, I don't subscribe to this idea. I used to, by the way. I've changed my mind on this. I don't subscribe to this idea that your mom and dad have total veto power, especially if you're old enough, you're out of your home. But here's what I would say. You're a fool if you don't listen to them. God gave you a mom and dad to help you with this very thing. Well, my parents aren't believers. Okay, I get that. But they're still your mom and dad, and God didn't make a mistake. So go talk to them. Go talk to them. And see what God might do. Number six, get counsel before you're married. Okay? I'd really love to do this with you before, not after. It's so much happier doing premarital counseling. (laughs) Right? And there's so many things that you can uncover and unpack if you'll do it. Number seven, get serious about your faith. Start pursuing Jesus if you're not. Listen, I hope those statistics I gave you are just ridiculously sobering. Because if you're not, if you're just going to dance around it, then you're, like I said, you're 20% more likely than the population out there that doesn't even believe in Jesus to get a divorce. Okay, so that's if you're not married. What about if you are married? Okay, number one, decide that divorce isn't an option. Just, just make that decision. We're not going to, that, that, I remember one time, and, I, and this is stupid, but I'm just telling you, when I was like married for two years or maybe less, and I think I said something to Michelle one time, and I was like, you know, well, we should just get a divorce. And I wasn't, I wasn't serious, but she was like, like, don't you ever talk like that, you know? I was like, whoa, you know? I've never talked like that again. But she's right. It's not something to joke about. It's not funny. Number two, understand that you're both sinners who need the grace of God. See, this will help you a lot. 
Honestly, if you just, if you just can sort of go, I, I've told you before, I, maybe you've heard me say this before. I've told our prep for marriage group that I, I, I've done now. I said, look, if you can unpack the gospel in your marriage, I'm a sinner, she's a sinner, we're sinners together, but we need the grace of God. And so because I've received the grace of God, I give you the grace of God. And because God's been merciful to me, I'll be merciful to you. Because God's forgiven me, I'll forgive you. If you can do that, I, I don't, I've not yet had a marriage counseling issue where a couple's come to me that I've said, oh, the gospel can't solve this one, ever. Number three, same for you. Get serious about your faith. Get in a home group. Be faithful to church. Be habitual about church, in fact. Number four, be humble enough to get help. Talk to your friends. Talk to your home group. Talk to a pastor. Cry out for help. God will help you. Okay, but let me, let me just end with this. What if I've blown it? Chris, I got a divorce in my past that wasn't biblical. Chris, I'm, I'm, I'm dating somebody that's not a believer. I'm remarried to a woman that I had an affair with, whatever. What if you've blown it? Then you just run to Jesus. Because there's not one sin that you could commit that Jesus can't forgive. Not one. Not one that if you'll just confess your sin, that he He's not ever going to turn his back, and he will be faithful and just. Maybe you're in a marriage right now, and you say, man, we didn't start this thing off right. You run to Jesus, you confess, you repent, and he'll cleanse your marriage. Is this what God does? He repairs people who have seriously blown it. That's what I told you last week. You're hearing this message, not because you've blown it, and you suck, and there is no hope. Goodbye. <laughs> it's... It's because there is hope. It's because God does. I mean, look around this room, and I'm looking at people that I know. God. And I see the way God has taken their fractured lives and put them back together again. It's awesome. God will do that for you. You run to him. Okay? Let's pray.